This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, recording right underneath my entire family who's upstairs setting up for Christmas. So you might get some interesting noises. So today we're talking about how the conversation of sex and gender in the human world translates also to the animal kingdom. All right, let's go. So for today's episode, this is a fan pick. This is the one that I've been teasing for quite a few weeks now, um, and I hope I do it justice. Danny, this one's for you. Um, And if you have ideas, just send a note to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. This one is a longer one, so I am just going to dive in. But first, I did want to say for the month of December, my hope is to be able to take a couple of weeks off. Um, I don't have anything planned. Um, I just... I'm going to need a break so I can, like, make, you know, festive happen in my house and get to learn about my new town and celebrate with my kid and my husband and my dog. Maybe finish this book that I've been working on for five years that I just need to find an editor for. If you guys know an editor, send them my way. But truly, I I am so thankful and so happy to have each and every one of you listeners check in from time to time and listen to this show and hopefully take something away, whether it's something silly or funny or interesting, or that it's something that just made you think of the world in a slightly different way. And for each and every one of you, I am so thankful. Um, And for the holiday season, all of the episodes are going to be a little lighter, a little bit more of a throwback to some of the earlier episodes where we're talking maybe a little bit more about science or some really fun and interesting stories that are Hopefully a little bit more serotonin inducing, a little more oxytocin. Um, And today's episode, like I said, it's going to be long. Um, We're going to have a lot of rapid fire things. There are a couple heavier subjects in today's episode. So um, if sex is not something that you're comfortable listening to with your kid in a car on your way to school, this might not be the episode for you. But I would put it out there. I would not put something out into the world that I also wouldn't let my kid hear. And I think... Um, honestly, the environmental impact of what we're doing to animals that I'm going to talk about in a bit with like chemical, um, chemical things used in agriculture that actually desexes frogs is way harsher than actually talking about sex. So I am going to be using words like clitoris, penis, vagina, all that fun stuff. So if there's anything in there that is going to make you uncomfortable or you're not ready to have some conversations regarding that with your kids, maybe skip ahead, although I hope you don't because there is a lot of really good stuff still in here too. With all of that being said, I will dive right in. So Danny, I hope you like this. So now we've touched briefly on this subject before in episode 38, Sniffing with What His Mama Gave Him. One of the stories in that, um, remember in season one, we had three stories per episode. One of those stories was about Yoriko, a fish who befriended a diver who saved her life in an underwater Shinto shrine in Japan. Yoriko eventually did what lots of fish do, change biological sex at some point in their lifespan to take advantage of either a longer mating span in their lifetime. So in Yoriko's case, she went from female to male where she had lots and lots of fish babies as a female, to male, where she became larger than the male who she mated with in her previous body and kicked him right out of her territory. So Yuriko could continue passing on genes to baby fish as a fish dad. And while this might seem unusual, this is super common. 
Over 500 species of fish are known to swap sexes at some point in their lifespan. Some, like Eureka the Kubidae, go from female to male to elongate their reproductive years, passing on more genetic code to even more and more babies in some way or another. Pretty slick, evolution. Pretty slick. But you may not have caught this, but both Marlin and Nemo in Finding Nemo were males. Okay, you probably noticed, but if Disney decides to do a threequel, Marlin might be Marlina. You see, clownfish, like Nemo, can pass on more genes as larger fish. So they start off as male, have a grand old time sowing their wild oats through their college years. Then as they get bigger, they swap sex where they can lay way more eggs because they are now larger. But it actually gets a bit more specific than that. Remember in the beginning of Finding Nemo, where Nemo's mom and babies were all eaten? Spoiler alert. So sorry. But Marlin survived, as did one little egg which hatched a Nemo. Well, I'm about to bust some truth bombs. Clownfish live in a school where the head of the class is a female. She is in charge of the school. Her second-in-command is always, and this wasn't my language, seconded by a submissive male with whom she mates. Okay, maybe this analogy is getting weird. Anyway, other fish in the school are all, all male. Clownfish are all born with all of the equipment to lay eggs or produce sperm. It's a classic why not both situation. Why choose between having a penis and sperm or having a uterus and eggs? You can have it all! And the magic of nature gives over 500 species of fish this ability to swap from one team to the other. In the case of the clownfish, while they are born hermaphroditic with the ability to become either male or female, all the eggs as clownfish hatch as male babies. So when the female dies, the second in command, remember, dudefish, her sexual partner, the big daddy of all those little fish, rises to the challenge. He turns his testes in at the door, pulls on some big girl ovaries, and becomes the new leader of the school. She then takes her brand new egg-lading body out for a test spin by tapping her second in command. The male who will be the next father of all those sweet babies, who she thinks will be able to, I'm guessing, rock a uterus like whoa. They kind of left all that out of the movie. So let's go back to Eureka, the Kubidae. This is a kind of wrasse fish. There's another wrasse, the blue-headed wrasse. This is a fish that got super clever. A fish that got its super clever name from <gasps> its blue head. The one blue-headed wrasse in the school is male, and he has some ladyfish friends who are all yellow. They just chill out in the Caribbean enjoying fish things like, uh, swimming? Seeing the sights? Not getting eaten by sharks? You know, fish things. But if the blue-headed male disappears for any reason at all, you know, may have missed the memo on not getting eaten by sharks, the largest yellow-faced lady within 10 minutes of his disappearance will start an incredible change triggered socially. After 10 days, her ovaries turn to testy swapping egg for sperm. And within three weeks, 21 days, she appears to observers completely and totally male. And it ain't no thang. Her fish friends don't say anything about her having a blue head, testes, and a sudden drive for chest bumping. They just look at him and say, Hey, love what you did with your head. Let's eat. Mind the sharks. This behavior of gender swapping from one to the other in one direction, never going back, the switch occurring once across some members of the species is called sequential hermaphroditism. Going through a one-way door, if you will. You can't go back. This door is locked. No backsies. But there are other kinds of hermaphrodites. One little fish called a goby can just go back and forth like, I do what I want. I gotta be me. And that might change next month or next year or after lunch. This is called bidirectional hermaphroditism. Y'all, this isn't just in fish. Bearded dragons, one of my favorite starter pets for responsible pet owners who are thinking of venturing outside of the traditional fuzzy domestic companions that poop in a box or drool on everything you love, have an interesting response to the temperatures getting hot, hot, hot. While they are in the egg, they can switch their chromosomes based on the temperature to become genetically and physically female. So usually when it's hot, 
My cats are miserable and I'm eating an ice cream cone until fall. To each his own. These babies, before they're even born, are like, it's toasty, I'm a girl. We all deal with heat in remarkable ways. We're going to keep up with the sex talk that I'm sure is making all the parents in their Volvos a little bit squirmy. Don't worry parents, I'll take one for the team. Let's talk about the simultaneous hermaphrodites. These animals have both a penis and a vagina, both the indoor and outdoor plumbing of the genitalia world. These animals can be either male or female as needed. My search history got super weird this week just before hanging out with my in-laws when I had to start searching for snail sex. Turns out, this is just netting me a whole lot of interesting, quote, recommended videos in my YouTube experience. <laughs> that said, snails are notoriously slow at everything, including making little snails, which I'm about to describe in great detail. But aside, baby snails are adorable. Anyway, from what I understand, snails are basically blind and deaf, so they follow a slime trail. You can picture it, right? right to the other snail. My favorite part of the snail sexcapades that I watched is that they just meet up at the snail bar and then figure out which one is the who's you daddy during mating. See, both snails, at least the garden variety I was watching a single YouTube video on, I need to be clear, <laughs> both would like to be the father, or let's be real, sperm donor as they piece right out without a goodbye snuggle, slowly, very slowly, out the garden door. But why do both want to be the sperm giver? Well, according to the narrator of, again, this one YouTube video, quote, because being a mom is hard work. You don't say. The words, quote, you might need a C-section because you may re-break your spine isn't something anyone wants to hear. My birth plan was a single word, epidural, which I got. And that's not to knock anyone else who's decided differently or wasn't given the choice. But for me, absolutely the best call I made in my entire life was to say yes please to the drugs. I was punched from the inside of my body for 10 months because math. Yo, we tell people that this is a nine month journey, but I can do math, 40 weeks, four weeks a month. That's 10 months, y'all. I was on medication to keep me from vomiting water up for five of those months, and I had stitches in place and no one wants to think about. So yes, being the mom is hard work. I'm sorry, <laughs> that was triggering. <laughs> anyway, the video in question is called Everything You Didn't Want to Know About Snail Sex. There were lots of cuts and, you know, lots of speeding up because nothing about snails is short except their stature. And I'd argue it has everything you didn't know you wanted to know about snail sex. The main takeaways, snails have an affectionate thing called a love dart. It's literally a dart. Though the word love might make this dart feel like it's a chill, soothing, calming dart. Nope. The snail who can pop their love dart out first, like a turkey timer popping up when turkey's done, or her mom human popping an inny belly button for an Audi around month four and becoming an Audi in a single day, which weird and funky, I'm still triggered. Anyway, said dart is the equivalent of a 15-inch knife being thrust into a human. So in the infamous words of my favorite board game Clue, it was the male presenting snail in the garden with the love dart. And as violent as that might sound, gastropod researcher Joris Kion has only seen one case of a signed lady snail death in the bizarrely violent mating habits of the garden snail. So what does the love dart do? Well, it's jabbed into the other snail. Okay, remember, at this point, everything is up in the air as to who's the daddy and who's left caring for an entire genetic code for the future generation. So how does the love dart determine who gets to fertilize the eggs and who's the fertilizer? Well, both snails must insert their penises into the other's vaginal tracts at the same time. I don't know if they go one, two, three, go, or one, two, three, beat, go. But either way, for sex to be successful in snails, they have to go at the same time. Both snails will deposit sperm. 
but it's the strength of the love dart ultimately determining whether or not the sperm fertilizes their partner's eggs. And the love dart has a hormone that prepares the other bodies to accept sperm. Whoever has the stronger love dart, like, like Pokemon stats, gets to be the dad. Keep in mind, this is all in the case of that one YouTube video I saw, other snails are more like maybe a duel. The first to draw the love dart wins. It's like Hamilton and Burr style, but without Weehawken and a slick soundtrack. And because it's my show and I came across this phrase, I'm putting it in. Tubalarians, it's a kind of flatworm. They mate by penis fencing. Y'all, penis fencing <laughs> with their heads. Okay, so I competed in saber, one of the three weapons in fencing, and I coached high schoolers in the sport for several years. There are lots of in-jokes in the fencing world. Lightsabers, kind of a huge hit. One-liners from The Princess Bride, Three Musketeers, and yes, jokes that have to do with saber masochism are plenty. But I have never heard of, until today, anything about penis fencing with faces, and I'm going to have to cut 30 minutes of me not being able to finish this sentence with professionalism. The interesting thing, turbolarians are a kind of flatworm. And since we were talking about flatworms, I had that talk with One Pagan last week on his book, Drunk Flies and Stone Dolphins. I kind of hyped it in the show for a couple weeks. His whole thing is on planarians, which are flatworms. And while these ones mate via penis fencing, on guard, <laughs> like, others are used in experiments in his lab using cocaine and narcotics in order to discover chemicals that can stop overdoses, which is One's whole super cool research thing. So go listen to him nerd out about flatworms, and I'm going to say it one more time for giggles, penis fencing. <laughs> okay, back on track. So now that we know that some species, the physical sex hormones are triggered by temperatures, like the bearded dragon, or hormones by violently stabbing your partner, we can now look at how this intersects with people. You know, the whole premise of this show. So let's look at sea turtles. Beach temperatures determine the sex of the turtle eggs. Cooler temperatures mean more males will hatch. Warmer, more female sea turtles. This might not seem like such a big deal, but with rising sea and beach temperatures during sea turtle incubation, the sea turtle population is skewing too heavily female. On Rain Island, 99% of sea turtles that were able to survive were female, and that is assuming that they survive at all, given that the sand is so hot with those teeny tiny delicate turtle eggs needing just the right temperature to survive, many of those eggs cook or fail, and in some devastating cases, there is complete nesting failure. The International Climate Summit just occurred. Climate change is a crisis that we humans are responsible for. And we are responsible for making difficult changes for ourselves, yes, but also for others, like the sea turtles. There are other ways in which humans are causing sex swapping in animals. Let's go back to our fish friends. Climate change is affecting the sex ratios of many fish. The system is becoming out of balance. You may have more males in some species and more females in others, which means that there aren't enough partners to be able to make viable offspring. And so many more species are in trouble. But one way in which humans are affecting sex swapping in the animal world that you may not think of is overfishing. So let's say fisher folk only take fish that are seven inches or longer. Well, if those larger fish happen to be females who are laying more eggs, or maybe they're males who are larger to defend a territory. Either way, taking a specific size of fish can leave a massive hole in the population. And if there aren't enough egg-laying females because they've all been fished out, the males have no one to mate with. So evolution benefits those fish who switch teams maybe a little earlier. If the fish is battered on the other side, say males are overfished, the ladyfish wouldn't have enough sperm donating fish to create a new generation of fishlets. So a triggering mechanism for some fish species is, well triggered, all systems go. It's like the draft, but for fish of a certain age, size, or in some cases, the temperature of the water can cause the ovaries to become over-onos, 
testes to become nopesies, sex hormones start to course through the fish in different ratios, which makes a different cocktail which changes the physical body of the fish. So let's switch directions a little bit, try to boost the mood a little. We have covered one-way sex swapping, two-way sex swapping, sex have all the things and go for broke, and some animals just say, eh, partners are hard. I'll just do this myself. I can do it all. And they do. There are some animals who engage in parthenogenesis. What's parthenogenesis? Well, when I say reproduction, my guess is most of you all think of needing two to tango. But here, one is not the loneliest number. It's the best number. These creatures can produce their own offspring and is a completely normal process in some invertebrates and lower plants. Lower plants. Ooh, gonna need some aloe for that sick burn. Was aloe a lower plant? I don't know. This isn't a plant podcast. All right, how? Well, when we think of traditional mating habits, most of you, I would guess, would be thinking of, you know, animals, usually male and female. But as we noticed today, two partners each give half of the DNA needed for a baby, usually in the form of sperm and eggs, some with the bonus stabbing wound, which is neither here nor there. So one sperm, one egg equals one little bundle of joy. In the case of asexual reproduction, not asexual reproduction, but asexual reproduction, meaning without sex, the creature or lower plant, sorry plants, cannot just give half of the DNA. There isn't another half to find. It's like someone having half of a BFF necklace, but there's no other half. This seriously cuts down on awkward dating and bad partnerships, but it also means the mom has to do the whole shebang. And as a result, sometimes offspring are even just full clones of mom. And in others, the mom gives two sets of slightly different X chromosomal numbers, almost like a bingo card. So they aren't quite identical to the mom. But let's be real, they would absolutely be confused for mom when everyone goes out for brunch. So in the second case, almost always the result are female offspring. One example of this is the New Mexico whiptail lizard. She, always a she, is a crossbreed of the western whiptail, which lives in the desert, and the little striped whiptail, which favors grasslands. This is a female-only species. There are no males that reproduce by producing an egg through parthenogenesis. So here's how it works for them, which is pretty ingenious if I must say so myself. So in order to drop an egg into the chamber for the lizards to start the parthenogenesis, they still kind of have to mate, but they don't need the sperm. So living up to their common nickname, the lesbian lizard, these lizards will effectively mate with other female lizards, which is theorized to stimulate ovulation. Why do we think this is a good hypothesis? While the lizards who do not go through this mating ritual just do not lay eggs. Pretty cool, huh? So this particular brand of asexual reproduction is frequently called a virgin birth, which was in the news quite a bit in the last few weeks. Not one, but two condors. If you recall back to episode 39, we talked about how condors basically went all spinal tap on a California woman's home. You know, they smash things, spring breaking on her porch. Well, the condors were at one point in the 1980s down to only 22 birds in the world. That's about the size of your first grade classroom. Scientists went on a condor catching mission and started a captive breeding program to try to save these giant, incredible and incredibly endangered birds. This program is still running. And this is where things get wonky. Two male birds didn't have any genetics matching any of the males in the program. In other cases where we wouldn't expect asexual reproduction, like in turkeys or pigeons and chickens, the babies generally die in the egg. They never hatch. But these two boy condors survived. I mean, not for long. One of them only lived for two years, and they think he died of malnutrition. The other made it to age eight, still not old enough for sexual maturity in condors as they live to 60 years old, old enough for like a condor AARP card. 
but he died of a foot infection. And it's believed that they actually had a genetic mutation that did not set them up for survival, which is a big bummer. My favorite quote of this whole article that I was reading on the condors, quote, they certainly weren't, shall we say, shining specimens of the condor. <laughs> Damien Chapman, a biologist of the Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium, told The Atlantic. <laughs> and while we think of parthenogenesis occurring when there just aren't any males around, which happens when animals have to just try everything under the sun to survive as a species, desperate times, desperate measures, females will rarely spontaneously be pregnant without the help from a partner and have an offspring. But, and y'all, this is so good. Sure, in most cases, it's theorized that if there isn't a partner around to contribute to making this baby. But the two female condors in question who had baby condors without a male assistant? <laughs> they were living in an enclosure with males. Males that they had mated with in the past. The researchers don't seem to have a good answer yet, but they're working on it. I think... If we were to suppose that maybe these ladybirds were saying something, then maybe they would just rather wash their hair feathers and do this alone than accept genetic offerings from their enclosure buddies. <laughs> maybe these female condors just didn't think of them that way. Maybe they would rather try something new. Maybe his breath stinks. I mean, honestly, have you seen what condors eat? They eat everything. Roadkill, eyeballs, all of it. So when you're in a cage that long with another condor... Condor couples therapy might be a good idea. But joking aside, the researchers hope that there were more babies born this way that they just missed. And that they only found these two males because they were trying to find which condor dad to give the congratulations cigar to. If more condors were born this way without a dad, they could have become healthy adults. I mean, it's not looking great, but it's possible. And for the condors, which went from 22 specimens in the 1980s, there are 500 birds today. So it's still critical that every chick is accounted for, and they are critical to the survival of this species. So some creatures routinely go through parthenogenesis as their only baby-making strategy, not as a last-ditch effort. But others can alternate between finding a mate and just deciding for a variety of perfectly valid reasons that she just wants to have a baby by herself, the zebra shark is one such creature. If there are plenty of mates around, zebra shark mom-to-be will scan the seven seas just looking for the right one. But while there are plenty of fish in the sea, sometimes we have to be much more specific. And often in the case of the zebra shark, without a suitable mate, she'll just go it alone. Lots of insects have young this way too, including my favorite, the honeybee. And my less favorite, ants. Sorry to all the ant folks out there. Just not my thing. And since we're talking about all sorts of things that might make some parents uncomfortable, let's just end with a big one. Hyenas. When early explorers first discovered the most common large predator in Africa, they thought the hyena was a hermaphrodite. Had all the sex organs. And by all the sex organs, they just really thought penis. Because from a distance, the hyena has the last laugh. Both sexes of the hyena have what appear to be a giant penis. They both experience erections, and truly the only surefire way to determine if a hyena is a male or a female from afar is to wait until she reaches sexual maturity and ends up pregnant. <laughs> like, because truly, you do not want to get that close to a wild hyena. Have you seen The Lion King? Vicious. But in many other species that have penis havers and vagina havers, you have a penis. Outdoor plumbing and vaginas, indoor plumbing. Seems like it would be pretty easy to tell the difference, right? The penis that early explorers and the researchers see when studying the spotted hyena is a penis for sure in males. But in females, it's not that at all. It's actually an enlarged, very enlarged clitoris. Instead of a vaginal canal where in many mammals a live baby emerges victorious through the birthing process, this penis-looking clitoris houses the birth canal. The hyenas have cubs go through that cervix, and instead of a short shot out into the world, these cubs essentially have to go through the birth equivalent of a much longer tunnel than necessary. I'm just really trying to avoid jokes about these, I'm guessing, dude-identifying researchers finding the clitoris, while also trying not to think about having a baby come out of my clitoris. Having a baby come out traditionally was bad enough. And while I thought I could do two subjects in one, 
sex swapping, and same-sex partnerships in animals, this episode is getting long, which means there will be another episode later on same-sex partnerships and strategies in the animal world, of which there are more than super cute gay penguins who raise chicks. We will get to it. But in the last few minutes of the episode, it is important to say, one other way in which this topic intersects with humanity A lot of what I was discussing today assumed a binary, in which typically means in the context of anything relating to sex and gender, boy or girl only. But as you can see in the animal world, this binary just simply doesn't exist in animals. And I'm going to say it right now, it doesn't exist in people either. We are all on a spectrum. Physically as discussed, yes, we may have individually more or less testosterone or estrogen in our systems, even if we are born with well, a penis or a vagina, or indoor or outdoor plumbing as it were. Weirdly, this comes up in the Olympics every few years when, well, let's face it, usually a woman comes out and cleans house in track and field. Then someone yells foul. She's too good. And then they run blood tests, or worse, need to see physical proof that she is in fact a she. An embarrassing strip down to make sure that a penis isn't there because that would be a scandal. And if the blood tests come back with too much testosterone, her metal is stripped too. All because of the body she's given. She doesn't fit in that box. And we know bodies happen in different ways. Might not feel like you fit in. But that not fitting in is often a superpower in disguise. Whether there's too much of one thing or too little of another, as long as someone fits nicely into a box, can easily be categorized, it's fine. But it's not. In some cases, high schools around the United States adults are demanding to see the genitalia of children to see what the equipment is that they have below the belt. Because for some reason, having a penis or a vagina is important in team sports. Or kids and adults who may have a girl brain and a boy's body, or don't feel like they fit in either box. Or sometimes both boxes depending on the day. Boys are supposed to like certain things, which we know is completely bunk. Girls, on the other hand, at least if you were to look at a bathroom door in a restaurant, all wear giant triangles for skirts. And while there are people who fit nicely into these categories we think of as boy or girl, my friend Kate, a woman, she builds boats. Her husband, Ben, also works on boats. She's going to engineering school, and even at her own wedding, I have never seen her in a skirt that resembles a triangle. I have friends who identify as male who wear high heels, and I'll say it, wear skirts better than I do. And I love skirts, if they have pockets. I need something to put my tools in, but I usually wear boots. I've had some ankle surgeries that make heels nearly impossible for me to wear and also nearly impossible for me to fence again. Maybe I'll take a page out of the penis fencing handbook, tape a Nerf sword to my forehead, have someone else do the same, make it a really funny game night. But we would, for obvious reasons, have to change the name. I don't think many people would want to or should come over to my place for advertised penis fencing. (laughs) I think my husband would be quite upset. And as there is nowhere else to put this, it's something that needs to be said. If someone is concerned about which bathroom someone else is using, considering the bathroom in your house is not segregated by gender or sex and everyone is just fine. Where you pee doesn't matter. Just ask the clownfish. They pee wherever and no one cares. If you feel like you don't fit in a box, that gender is stupid, I'm with you. Gender is stupid. (laughs) The people who cling to the idea of gender having to be one way or another are the ones who need boxes, not you. There are great books for kids, including one from Teresa Thorne, the host of a podcast I adore called One Bad Mother. It's not for children, but it helps children. Her book is called It Feels Good to Be Yourself, a book that we got for our kiddo when her friend came out as transgender at age six. And to all the adults out there who thought that it was a phase, it clearly wasn't. It's been years, and this kid knows who they are now fully, and if it changes later, that's cool too. That's the cool thing about a spectrum. It's flexible. We don't need to police kids in their bodies, or adults in theirs. And for the adults who might be worried about their kid being picked on if they come out and use the boxes to keep things comfortable, I promise you, after talking with friends who grew up to eventually get to be their authentic selves as adults, your kid will learn more from you advocating for them, even if it's hard and you don't understand it, than they will from you telling them to hide who they are in a box. The simplest thing you can do is use a kid's preferred name. They don't even have to be categorized as transgender or something else to have a preferred name. My kiddo goes by her nickname, 
her teacher uses her nickname, the world uses her nickname, all of her homework is in her nickname. She feels better owning her identity and that is no harm to us or the people around her. Using preferred pronouns is the simplest thing that we can do to support kids and adults as they figure out who they are. And if you mess up, no worries. Try again and move on. It takes practice to unlearn things, and as long as you aren't a hyena's clitoris about it, you'll be fine. Language changes, boxes can be burned, and gender is stupid. And if I can say that as a 40-year-old cisgendered white woman, anyone can. So thanks today for joining me on Bewilderbeasts. If you like this show, consider donating at any level for bonus content and extra goodies at every level if you're into that kind of thing. Patreon.com slash BewilderbeastPod. And if you need resources for yourself or for others or for kids in your life on some of the topics today, check out Teresa Thorne's It Feels Good to Be Yourself. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who change the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McKee McGrath with Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from theconversation.com, the Oxford Dictionary, thank you, <laughs> sbs.com, inverse.com, scientificamerican.com, google.com on sea turtles and climate change, berkeley.edu, biologicaldiversity.org, dtnpf.com, and smithsonianmag.com. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music is provided by Pixabay and freesound.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week. What's parthenogenesis? Parthogenesis. Parthenogenesis. 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 Parthenogenesis.